Hello, podcast listeners. You are now listening to the Coffee, Health, and Science podcast. I'm your host, Jordan River, and I want to thank you for tuning in today. Before we get started, please share the Coffee, Health, and Science podcast with a friend, with a peer, with a colleague. The Coffee, Health, and Science podcast is growing, and it's thanks to you. Make sure you're subscribed. Give us a good rating and review. We do appreciate it. Today, we have show favorite Dr. Coffee back on the line. How are you doing, my friend, Dr. Coffee? Well, it's another day above ground living the dream, my friend. Yes, it is. I am living the dream here on this podcast, and there's no one I'd like to uh, speak to more, especially about today's topic. We're talking brewing today. We're talking brewing for health, but I imagine it's going to go a lot of different directions. And Dr. Coffee, you're the perfect person to dive into this episode with. So thank you. Do you know why I'm the perfect person to dive in this episode with, my friend? <laughs> why is that? Because it's genetic for me to understand this. You know oh, why? Why? Because I'm a Hebrew. <laughs> I, you know what? You set me up. I was actually taking you seriously for a second, Dr. Coffee. <laughs> now, I hope we don't get any nasty letters from people saying <laughs> that I made fun. I am Jewish, but I'm a Hebrew. So, uh, so you are we, perfectly, uh, you're uniquely, uniquely uh, qualified. And listen, people <laughs> have to understand with this podcast, Dr. Kavi brings the humor every time. And you know what? Might not be for everybody, but you know what? I get a lot of good feedback, Dr. Kavi. So you do your thing, man. <laughs> That's why we love you here. So listen, we are talking about the brew for sure. Um, this is something that's been really long overdue, Dr. Coffee, and I imagine that it's long overdue. Please correct me if I'm wrong, but is brewing for health the most important aspect? Does it really make a huge difference the way we prepare our coffee? So the way you asked me that question is a difficult one to answer, and here's why. You've got three components one of them is the type of coffee you use. Mm. The second one is the type of water you use. Right. And the third is how you brew it. So all three of those are equal players. Sure. Because if you take a, I don't want to get too ahead of me now, but if you take a non-organic moldy coffee, mm -hmm and you put it and do the best brewing method in the world, you still, you know, it's like we say in computers, junk in, junk out. Yes, exactly. The, sa the same thing is if I'm, God forbid, living up in Flint, Michigan, and they haven't changed all the waters, so there's still lead in it, and I'm using tap water, then it's still junk in, junk out. Absolutely. And then the third is brewing, and the way you phrased the question, it almost sounded like you wanted me to say brewing's the most important. I can't say that brewing is important, but all three need to dance together. I was I was not trying to lead you there, Doctor Coffee, um, but that that is a very good picture you painted because if you remove any of those one thing, like you said, the chain any 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 weak link breaks the chain, which makes perfect sense. And I'll tell you, Doctor Coffee, is what's really opening my eyes is the tap water issue being so uh, non uniform across this country. So you gave a very extreme example in Flint, Michigan. Um, there's a really great documentary on Netflix highlighting just how bad that situation is. But having lived on the West Coast and all over the Midwest, tap water is not created equally. Municipalities are probably dealing with different water sources and are definitely dealing with different filtration processes. I am frankly ashamed of some of the water quality in the Midwest having lived out West. I mean, it, there is a massive, massive difference in taste. You can go get a test kit. The pH is all wacky. Um, so it's it's kind of... And I know you feel the same way I do. It's kind of shameful how we've, how we really haven't given credence to something so important as to our national water supply. Yes, we haven't. And, um, you know, water, we can live a month without food, a week without water, one minute without coffee, no one <laughs> minute without air. It's one of the most important so, things. It, I mean, it's just, it, it really yeah. is a shame. Yeah. And, you know, there's a really great product called Vitev out of, um, out of Canada. And anytime you want to interview Jamie from Vitev, I'm sure he'd love to talk to you about 
uh, simple water filtration program. Yeah, absolutely. And I actually use a Vitev water filter myself. What really opened my eyes was um, realizing that I can't use my new tap water on my home herbs. They, it, it's, it's literally so poisonous out of the tap that I have to filter it. How is that acceptable? So exactly, it's not. It's not, and I feel bad for people that say, "Okay, what I'll do instead is I'll use a lot of bottled water, plastic bottles, right?" And and then I don't care what I shower with. You, you know, Good point. we still absorb water through the skin. Um, so <laughs> got to filter. You yeah, know, that's a good point, Dr. Copy. Yeah. Very good point. Sorry, we got off on a little t- tangent there. Let's bring it back. We're bringing it back to the three aspects of brewing. Let's focus in on, well, where do you want to take it first? Well, I think the first thing we need to talk about, and then we'll come back to it after we talk about the brewing methods, is uh, starting to look at filtered versus unfiltered. Sure. So there's two ways to do filtering, I mean, to, to brew coffee. One of them is with filtering. And when I say filtered, I really mean a paper filter Mm -hmm. um, versus unfiltered, which is anything not using a filter. Some people feel that when you use a metal filter, you're still filtering, but that's not what the... um, science says when they do the study. Interesting. Like a French press has that filter in there, but it's not super, super fine like a paper filter. Correct. Okay. I follow. So filtered coffee is coffee that's running through a paper filter, which catches most of the oils. Oh, wow. Unfiltered coffee is coffee that doesn't go through a paper filter. So it's either completely unfiltered, like direct grounds and water or it runs through a metal filter, which is like French press or espresso. Mm -hmm. And they allow the oils to pass through. And unfiltered coffee in the literature is most of the time called boiled coffee. Mm -hmm. So filtered coffee would include drip, pour over, unless you're using a permanent filter, um, a mocha pot doesn't have a permanent fi- uh, coffee filter. Mm-hmm. Espresso doesn't have a coffee filter. Mm-hmm. Aeropress doesn't. French press doesn't. Um, the oils have two compounds in them. You know, there's about a thousand compounds in coffee. Jesus. <laughs> the oils have two co- compounds. One is called cafestol. Oh boy, we've heard that one before. We don't want to miss that, yep, do we? we? Well, I still think it's a great name for a coffee shop. <laughs> <laughs> Cafestol, totally. And the other one is Kawiol. Oh, and we definitely don't want to miss that one. Right. Wow. So, which one do you want to talk about first? <laughs> well, listen, they've both come up on the show before, but why, uh, why don't we start with cafestol and recap? Because these are two super, super important compounds. And if a brewing method lessens this, this is a big, important decision when it comes to the health of your brew. Yeah, and you just actually said it. Let me, instead of talking about one versus the other, let's talk about both of them first. Sure. So high doses of either one will elevate cho- cholesterol. We don't want the LDL particles to be sitting around for a long period of time in the blood because then they'll oxidize the blood. We, we want to um, get good clearance of LDL from the body, which we don't get when there's cafestol and kawiol present. Oh. And we don't want atherosclerotic lesions to show up. So we want to be able to filter out the oil compounds. And the only way to really do that is with a coffee filter. But am I not? I thought there was a bunch of good health benefits to Cabwayol and and that sort of thing. So there are, except for the fact that that they elevate cholesterol. So people that have elevated cholesterol want to filter them out. Okay. Wow. That's huge. And again, the importance of knowing your body, knowing your lineage, what you might be susceptible for 
and then making these lifestyle changes accordingly. That's super interesting, Dr. Coffey. So this is, this is a beneficial compound, but if you have cholesterol issues, this, this isn't the right thing for you. Correct. And I'll cite the study. I hope everybody has pencil and paper today or, <laughs> or, or something, because we're going to be going into a fair amount that they want to write this down. Sure thing. I'll give you the name of the study at the end, but there, it showed that 73 milligrams of cathistol a day for six weeks can lead to an increase of cholesterol by six by a worry, worrying some 66 milligrams per deciliter. Hmm. Wow. So the average French press cup contains three to six milligrams. Interesting. Interesting. So this is a, yeah, this is a real, th- and, and do you not think this is much of an issue for those who are, like, like you said, it's more about your cholesterol levels than anything else. Um, would you consider it an unhealthier brew because of that? Or is it more like figure out what's right, right for you? Yeah. So they're, they're trying to say it's an unhealthier brew because of that, but there are people, it really is individualized. There are people walking around like my wife is walking around with, um, health HDL, very, very high HDL levels, um, in the hundreds and her chance of having a heart attack is like zero. Right. Um, yeah. So it really depends what your cholesterol looks like. So fascinating. Yeah. And it also depends what your triglycerides look like. But that's huge. I mean, you can at least, if you have a general idea, you know, if you're going after heart health, if you're going after cholesterol minded, you should be filtering your coffee. So at least that's a good kind of general scope to give the listeners. I like that a lot. Yeah. Now let's talk about the beneficial effects of cathistol and Kawiol. Yes, for sure. So there's a nice study that showed that cathistol kills leukemia and kidney cancer cells. Jeez. Kills it? Doesn't this isn't prevention? So it kills leukemia cells and kidney cancer cells. Now, the study was done with mice. Oh, interesting. But it was a good study. Jeez, that's wild. So anti-cancer properties right off the bat in those, yep. in those uh, coffee cherry oils, those concentrated, you know, uh, are they lipids? Is that a correct term? Yeah. So interesting. So fascinating, yeah. man. So cathistol also has a anti-diabetic effect. Mm. Mm-hmm. Kawiol inhibits fat accumulation. Sure. And the way it does that is it activates a pathway in our body called AMPK, hmm. which can um, help us with uh, weight loss. It can help us with um, not having, uh, cell membranes change towards, uh, towards being more susceptible to cancer. It really is a very interesting study. So when we talk about individualizing it for each person, they have to make the decision about how much of the oils they want out. And I'm going to sort of lean towards helping people understand that when we have gone through the different uh, brewing processes. Sure, sure. Yeah, that's that's a good way to frame it, though. I'm glad you went with this first and breaking it down into filtered versus unfiltered, because Dr. Coffee, I got to tell you, even though I've been doing this show, this is, this is eye-opening. This is news to me, and I'm going to be thinking about this now when I choose preparation methods. Oh, good. Good. Then let, let me start off with that, then. Boiled and filtered coffee both reduce the risk of type 2 diabetes. Mm-hmm. Boiled coffee, remember I said boiled is non-filtered, yep. uh, has a lower risk of prostate cancer. Hmm. Um, boiled coffee lowers l- liver enzymes. Right. Um, so most evidence shows that coffee, whether boiled or filtered, is protective against liver cancer, liver disease, and mortality from chronic liver disease. 
but specifically the enzymes seem to be benefiting yeah. from the boiled. Yep. And, you know, Dr. Chopra has talked about that a lot. The liver specialist mentions those enzymes, enzymes, enzymes. So that's fascinating. That's coming from the, the oils, the lipids. <laughs> yep. It's wild. So then let's take into account one more thing before we start talking about brewing methods. Mm -hmm. um, let's talk about roast. Yes. If you want more cafestol and caliol, then you brew a light roast. Mm -hmm. and you use a non-filtered method. So that gives you your most. Mm -hmm. So then you can manipulate it so you can use a darker roast and non-filtered for medium amounts, and you can use a darker roast and non-filter and filtered for the most removed. So interesting. Playing with those oil levels. Yep. That surprises me a little bit, though, because, you know, when those those well, actually, I guess that makes sense, because when you take a look at the over roasted beans that are so popular now, you can see that the oil is almost visible on the outside. But I imagine that's because it's being cooked out of them and that the lighter roasts keep that oil within the bean better. I know that's a very lay breakdown, but is that an accurate one? Yep. Makes perfect you've sense. Given it, you, yeah, you've said it well. Hmm. Well, I'm definitely going to be considering this for sure when, when I choose brewing methods. If you want to dive into specific brewing methods, I would love to cover a couple. Yes, and then we're going to come back and talk about which is the winner. and <laughs> Definitely. And then also, I want to follow up at the end here uh, a little bit of cold brew chat. Uh, it's in brewing methods. So okay, well, there you go. <laughs> we're, we're all set. So let's start with the easiest to find, easiest to buy, the cheapest easiest to make a great cup of coffee with, which is French press. Mm -hmm. So a French press, you put the water in, you pour in the boiling water, you let it sit, you then press down with a filter, and, um, and uh, you get a nice cup of coffee. You got the filtration, you got the heat, and you probably have some pressure in there. I, I mean, you can, you can feel the pressure when you're pushing that thing down. Right, but it's not um, it's not being brewed under pressure. So mm. I want to make sure we're clear. True. That yeah, it's steep. The You're amount right. yeah. of time, yeah, the amount of time we're pushing that thing down does not really make a big difference. Oh, interesting. Okay, good to know. Yeah. So you're going to use about two tablespoons per one cup of water. Mm -hmm. You want a medium grind. Mm -hmm. um, you put the coffee in, you put in the boiling water. The way you make it is you boil the water and then let it sit for about one minute so it's not it's still in an active boil. Then slowly pour the water in. What's your perfect time for Swirl it around uh -huh. a little bit. Sure. Put the top on so that the filter is sitting on the top of the water. And then you, you set your timer for about four minutes. Mm -hmm. Okay. And then when the timer goes off, you slowly press the plunger down. A feeling of relaxation washes over you when you push that thing down and you feel the little bit of give back. And just for a moment, the world is okay. <laughs> Well, yeah, so let me let me share. I feel that no matter how you make coffee, that should be your time to practice your mindfulness. Oh, love it. Absolutely. So, you know, I'm, I can't be like the da Dalai Lama and be mindful 24-7, <laughs> but I can make sure I'm mindful for the five minutes it takes for me to make coffee. I like that, man. I like that. It's a powerful practice. Yeah. In, um, just for reference, uh, eight ounce cup of coffee that's been French pressed gives you about 108 milligrams of caffeine per eight ounce. Interesting. Always on your radar. I know you're a fan of that caffeine. Okay. So that's a good overview of French press. I have a feeling that French press, oh, I'm not going to make any guesses cause I don't want to, I don't want to give anything away, but let's move on here. <laughs> okay. So the next one is automatic drip coffee. The automatic drips are what I grew up with with my parents' house. Coffee That's maker. That's what they would use. And Mr. Coffee came along and changed 
everything for everybody because they really had automated the drip process. Yeah, he's one step below was, Dr. Coffee, Mr. Coffee is he doesn't have a <laughs> he doesn't have a decree. So yeah, don't follow don't That's follow right. his podcast. <laughs> That's right. The you know, the the nice thing you know, we're all lazy. That's the problem. The nice thing about Mr. Coffee is you can grind it up or you don't even grind it. You buy ground you throw it in at night, you put it in the water, and you set what time you want the clock to go off. Totally. And it, it does it. After having kids, it's changed my world to where uh, it didn't matter before, but now you wake, you walk downstairs and you just want to press a button at the most. <laughs> yep, exactly. Yep. So. Um, paper filter. Paper filter. Mm -hmm. Maybe a finer grind. But yeah. Well, yeah, you can. You, uh, there are people that will buy these gold filters for their um, oh, automatic good point. drip. It's not all paper filters. Good point. It's not all paper filters, no. Interesting. Um, you get about 145 milligrams per cup of coffee from a drip. Mm, a little bit more. Um, you, you have to be careful as to what type of filter you're using. Do you know this? Are you talking about, aren't some of them like treated with like... Bleach and yeah, stuff? Yeah, so standard white paper coffee filters are bleached with chlorine. Ugh. And they Why? contain this <laughs> because they are. It leaves a residue of this uh, carcinogenic chemical called epichlorohydrin. Mm, sounds healthy. And it also has dioxin. Okay, so avoid so those. Dioxin Literally is no the reason to buy those. Product, yeah, bleaching. Okay. And it can ruin hormonal balance in the body, so you don't want to. Um, you can get an unbleached paper filter, or some people are using a reusable hemp, hemp filter. Oh, nice. Yeah, that makes sense. Which, which is better for the environment. You don't keep throwing it out. Oh, so. for sure, yeah. Um, but truthfully, I, I use a paper filter. <laughs> I use uh, I use the unbleached little brown naturalish ones that you get from whatever the health food store, and I don't think they're that much more. I'm not I'm not putting that bleach in my coffee, man. That's a that's a hard stop for me. <laughs> yep. Yeah. Okay. So here's how here's how hard it is to make uh, Mister Coffee. You put the grounds in the filter, you pour the water into the reservoir, you hit brew, and you're done. <laughs> Bam! You just watch it drip. And then, okay, like you said, a little bit more caffeine and the, a lot of the oils are removed by the filter. Just really quickly before right. we move on, is, it, is, is all of the oils in Cabway Oil removed or is it just the majority of it? Majority. Okay. All right. I'm with you. Okay. Now you got the pour overs. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So pour over is neater than the, than the uh, drip in the fact that if you're doing your mindfulness, you actually get to be mindful with a pour over. Yes. So the pour over would be like a Chemex or yep. Chemex. Yep. Um, I personally am not a big fan because I don't like the taste of it. It's either too weak or too strong for me. Interesting. But most people love it. Mm -hmm. um, you can get a stronger, more intense flavor from it um, if you wet the grounds evenly. So you get a tea kettle with a kind of a swan neck. You heat that, shut the water off when it's boiling, wait a minute, and then slowly pour the hot water all over the grind so they bloom. Mm -hmm. And then when they are blooming, meaning they've absorbed a little bit of water, then you start pouring the water in to the Chemex and it'll filter through. Now, Chemex has their own set of papers. Mm -hmm. You buy the Chemex ones versus the other perfectly fit it makes it, into those little makers but they also have like you said don't they have the little metal ones that you can do your own little thing they do yeah those are nice too and i'll tell you you mentioned the bloom process that's one of the best parts of this method i have to say is you really get to enjoy that aroma and the visual of it too very very appetizing i will say 
again, if you want to practice your daily mindfulness, <laughs> making your coffee is the place to go. Totally. And this might be a, this might be one of the more fun ones for that. And would you say that maybe it's a little bit more of an art than a science when it comes to like, I see when my brother-in-law does it, he, he raises the uh, water as he's pouring it to try to cool it through the air. And it's kind of like a artistic practice a little bit more, maybe. It is. There are some people like my daughter who weigh everything, <laughs> who measure that the water is boiled, and then she measures that two minutes. She sets her her timer for two minutes to wait <laughs> nice. for the water to cool, and then she even measures the grounds on a scale. So <laughs> there the are gram. people that are <laughs> analytic like that. That's cool. Versus me and your brother in law who sit there and make a swell. Love it. All right. So we've covered French press, coffee maker, and pour over. What's next? Espresso. Your favorite, right? Dr. Or one Coffee's of your favorites. Favorite. Yeah, totally. Nice. Now, hold on a second. This is, this is, comp- you got pressure in this one. This is going to change up a lot of stuff, I imagine. Yeah. So um, there are machines out there that are labeled as espresso that are not espresso. So I want to make sure we understand the difference. Uh, between them. What espresso really is, is there's pressure involved and there's steam involved. Mm -hmm. If you don't have the pressure, um, which is measured by bars, Mm -hmm. have you heard that term before? Sure, yeah. Okay. So it's measured by bars. You get 9 to 15 to, to 20 bars For espresso, you've got these others like mocha pots, which we'll get into, but they're like 1.5 bars or 50 PSIs of pressure. Not familiar with that. They're not not the same thing at all. Okay. So a mocha pot's like a drip... uh, uh, like a drip espresso (laughs) instead of a a pressure espresso. Okay. You're going to use the finest grind Mm -hmm. for espresso. And um, what's interesting about espresso is is some um, coffee uh, bean makers call their beans espresso beans. Uh huh. Right. That so means how nothing. could that? Yeah, I was going to say, how could that be a thing if it's a preparation method? That's like saying French press beans. Yep. Interesting. So it's it's just it's meaningless. You can use any coffee you want as long as it's grind ground finely to make espresso. And um, there are some types of coffees that um, will give a bigger crema than another. Mm -hmm. For sure. Um, But it it doesn't matter. A coffee bean is a coffee bean uh, to make espresso. Love it. So we have the pressurized, tightly packed grounds there, and then passing, like you said, steam through them. I imagine this has an effect on the compounds within the coffee. I imagine there's not a lot of studies on it, but I would love to see to see more. There are a lot of studies on it. Oh, um, interesting. Do you know how old the espresso is? I would guess, I, I bet you're going you're gonna to tell me that it's much older than I think it would be. How old are we talking? Luigi Becerra, he patented the first steam drive driven espresso in 1901. <laughs> wow, yeah, that is that is quite a long time ago. Steam driven espresso, love it. In 1905, a guy named Pavoni bought the patent rights and he marketed it as Pavoni Ideal. Wow. That's incredible. So I, I bet you, you, you like have a shrine. Pavone. You have a shrine to Pavoni in, in your house. I do. I do. <laughs> I do. I have this uh, frame that sits over it. That's halfway filled with uh, coffee beans, and in the middle it says, "In case of emergency, break glass." <laughs> yes, I love it. <laughs> so, um, the next. You ready to move on to the next? Absolutely. Yeah. Okay. So the next is cold brew, Dr. Coffee's other favorite. Interesting. Uh, so this is vastly different. How is this going to affect the health compounds? I love coffee, uh, cold brew coffee. I really does. <laughs> I love it because it 
decreases the acidity mm. and you get a really different taste from a good cold brew coffee. Definitely. It brings out different profiles. Yeah, it really does. It's like um, two-thirds less acidic than any other coffee. So people that have, you know, reflux, the way to drink is a cold brew. So what cold brew means is that you're grinding up the beans, and I use a medium grind, Mm -hmm. and then you put them into a jar, and then you pour in cold water, and you wait. Um, <laughs> and you wait. <laughs> 18 to 24 hours. Okay. Some people do 12. I don't think that's enough. <laughs> I've done 12, 18, 24. I think 18 really works well. The other thing I do that some people don't do, though, is I put it in the fridge. I don't let it just sit out. Right. Okay. So that's why I can get my 18 hours. Whereas if you're letting it sit on the counter and it's warm, not cold, then you're probably done at 12. Okay. So the way you make cold brew is you get your cold brew uh, coffee ground medium. You put it into a a jar. You pour in your water. You swirl it around. Close the lid. Put it in the fridge and let it sit for. 18 to 24 hours, then you take it out and you're going to somehow siphon it. If you want to pour it through a pour over, you'll get a good coffee and you'll remove the oily products. Mm-hmm. If you want to put it through a cheesecloth, you'll re- remove some of the oily products. Ooh, okay. Uh huh. And if you want to put it through metal, you won't remove any almost any of the oily products. Interesting. And how do you do it? I do a cheesecloth. Nice little medium. I was going to say, never underestimate the cheesecloth. You got to have cheesecloth in your kitchen if your kitchen's worth its weight in salt. (laughs) Is that a term? (laughs) (laughs) Um, Absolutely. And the nice thing about cold brew is it will last in the refrigerator without going stale for much longer than regular hot brewed coffee. Amazing. Okay, listen, we are running up against the clock here. We have to pick a winner. Is that the whole list? What, what, if, okay, before we dive into the definitive winner, it, first of all, it sounds like some of this de- is dependent, right? Whether or not you have cholesterol uh, issues should determine whether or not you use a filter. If you have acidity issues, I'd imagine that obviously cold brew is the way to go. Um, that being said, what's your final say on health and brewing methods? Well, I'll tell you what I really think is that you should start your morning with a couple shots of plain espresso. Mm -hmm, Okay. And during the day, you should be drinking cold brew. Now, you can use cold brew hot. You can heat it. So it doesn't have to be iced coffee, though. I love my iced coffee. Interesting. But if you make your own cold brew um, and you use a cheesecloth, then during the day you're drinking your other three to four cups of coffee. Remember, I recommend five to six cups of coffee every day. (laughs) Uh, You're drinking your other four four or five cups of coffee. Um, That is probably the best of both worlds. Interesting. uh, Mix it up is what you're saying. Exactly. Why not, right? Diversify the different inputs, diversify the different methods, any, any compounds that may be brought out or minimized by certain methods. Why not diversify? I like that, man. Great. Drinking more coffee. You just gave us permission to drink more. Why not? Why not? Um, just so your audience doesn't think I, that I'm not impartial. Um, you still have a mocha pot. You still have Turkish coffee and you still have an AeroPress. Oh, man, I always feel like we need to follow up with a second episode here. We could do that because um, I'd love to tell you about uh, caffeine and coffee as a stimulant, and we haven't really talked about this on this time. Okay, we're going to follow up. We can follow up, and then I can tell you about other things being used for coffee. We should do a kind of uh, brewing from around the world, maybe. That would be cool. 
Yeah, um, we can do that. Yeah, Brazil, Brazil. They put a little cinnamon, I think, in their coffee. We do, we do like a little cultural. Yeah, very, very excited to dive into this more. And you really got the coffee history going, uh, Doctor Coffee. I'm doing these these kind of deep dives into various parts of coffee history, and the Turkish coffee houses came up, and why they served it scalding hot, so that you'd just take it in little sips, and you'd be able to stay there for a long time, and talk about politics, and talk about revolution, and very, very cool stuff, man. Thank you, Dr. Coffee, for taking uh, the time to come on the show today, and all the wonderful episodes that you provide. My pleasure. I'm going to brew some coffee. I'll talk to you later. (laughs) All right, everybody. Thank you for tuning in. We'll see you next time on the Coffee Health and Science Podcast. Bye-bye.